Good morning and welcome to the 27th meeting of the Rural Affairs and Islands Committee in 2024. Uh, and before we begin, can I, as always, please ensure, uh, ask people to please ensure that their electronic devices are switched to silent. Uh, this morning we've got Rhoda Grant and Beatrice uh, Wishart uh, participating remotely. Uh, before we begin, can we consider whether we take item four in private? Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. Our next item of business today is evidence on the amendment to the joint fisheries statement. And I welcome to the meeting Mary Goujon, the Cabinet Secretary for Rural Affairs, Land Reform and Islands and her supporting officials, with Jane McPherson, who is the, the Head of Fisheries Management Strategy. Um, and we have up to 90 minutes uh, for this discussion and invite the Cabinet Secretary to make an opening statement. Thank you, uh, thank you very much, Convener, and for the invitation to speak to you today about the consultation on the draft amendments to Annex A of the Joint Fisheries Statement relating to pr the production of the Scottish-led fisheries management plans. Now, I know that all of us here today understand the importance of Scotland's fishing industry to our community's economy as well as to our culture. We all want a sustainable and a safe industry, one that has space to thrive alongside other users of the sea and one that can fully capitalise on a healthy marine environment. And ensuring that our fish stocks are healthy and being fished responsibly is, of course, a key part of this. Good progress is being made. The Scottish Sustainable Fishing Indicator demonstrates that the sustainability status of commercial stocks in our waters has increased over time from 37% in 1993 to 70% in 2022. Now, fisheries management plans should be a tool that help us to continue to manage sustainably and, where necessary, to deliver improvements in our approach. FMPs will also play an important role in improving transparency around management and measures that we take, something that I know is, of course, really important to the committee as well as to our stakeholders more widely too. But it is also important to reflect that even without FMPs, we do already have a strong suite of measures in place and in development to support management of the fishing sector and deliver environmental protections. And FMPs are about enhancing our approach, not replacing it. Fisheries management is, of course, complex. There are a range of stakeholders who rightly want to be listened to, and it's important that we do provide the space for that. We also don't operate in a static environment. Fish stocks are ever-changing, science is always evolving, and we need to take account of this when we're developing FMPs so that they can remain relevant and reflective on the broader situation. The views that have been submitted to the committee in your call for evidence, I think, reflect the complexity of fisheries management and demonstrate the importance of us getting it right. The amendments that have been proposed within the amended draft Annex A of the JFS are fairly simple in and of themselves. We are extending the deadline for delivery by two years and merging two of the plans for cod into one so that we better reflect the IC's advice for the Northern Shelf cod stock. I know that two years can feel like a long time, but the reality is that to properly engage with stakeholders, to have that meaningful consultation and to ensure that the FMPs are fit for purpose and reflective of the intention uh, intention of the Fisheries Act and to properly engage across the UK administrations, that time is needed. We have already found in our development so far that the steps involved in developing these FMPs are complex, they are time consuming, but they are necessary so that the FMPs ultimately produced are meaningful. And I think it is better to take the time to get the FMPs right rather than doing that too quickly. The consultation on these amendments is of course ongoing and we will of course be interested in the committee's views. In our view, the proposals made within the consultation provide that right, right course of action that will enable the best FMPs to be delivered and for us to be able to listen to stakeholders and to take their thoughts on board. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions from the committee. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Cabinet Secretary. Um, whilst there's, there's mixed views on, uh, from the industry uh, on the, the delays and, and the lengthy de uh, delays. So can, can you tell us exactly where did it all go wrong? Um, wh why uh, was a deadline uh, having to be extended by two years? We appreciate that, uh, and most would uh, take on board that it's important to get these things right rather than to do them quickly. Um, but at some point, there must have been a realisation that the deadlines were, were far from achievable. Um, so when did you realise that was going to be the case? And, and why uh, 
is the deadline having to be increased by two years? Why, why is the, the prediction of when you could get these done so dramatically changed? Uh, well, what I'll do, first of all, I'll respond to your question, but I think Jane can talk a bit more about the process, I think some of the work that's been done so far. But I think one thing I would want to make clear is that fisheries management plans are a completely new tool and a completely new process. So I think that's something in and of itself. And, uh, of course, we knew that the timescales that had been set out within the Annex A of the JFS were always going to be, um, they were ambitious, uh, and I think that was quite right. But I think it's, of course, as we've been going through this process, recognised that more time is needed to be able to get this right. And that's for a number of different reasons. Not least, you'll have seen from the stakeholders who've contacted the committee. Now, uh, initial drafts had, well, very initial drafts had been shared with them. Um, of course, they have concerns about what they see within that, but there's still so much work to be done. And that's what the time scale and the extra time scale uh, and having that, that extra two years will enable us to do is to have that full engagement uh, with our stakeholders. We then have to go out to a full public consultation on that. We'll need to reflect on the results of a consultation before we then um, redraft the plans and publish the, the final versions of them. But I would also just want to point out too that while some of the, the other administrations have published some fisheries management plans, we're not alone in the challenging timescales that were, were set out in the GFS. Other administrations have found themselves in the same positions and n n now know that we need that bit of extra time, which is why all of us together have gone out jointly uh, to do this consultation. And I would also point out too that while the Scottish Government is leading on, well, 21 FMPs within this, they are still joint plans, which means that it's not just the engagement with stakeholders, it's also the engagement we then need to have to reach agreed positions with the other administrations. So again, all of that has taken extra and added time. And of course, we've had a UK general election in the middle of that as well, a new government in place. So to enable all of those discussions to take place, I think has taken more time than anybody could have anticipated, which is why all administrations find themselves in this position. But if it's helpful, I'll get Jane to set out a bit more about the process and where we've got to. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, it, it, thinking back and reflecting um, where we've come in the last 18 months or so, um, so there was always a staggered timetable in terms of the, how the plans would be produced across the UK. So, we knew that um, DEFRA would produce a series of front, what they call front runner plans. Um, so, they went through a process in consultation with the rest with the other administrations um, to think about what the front runner plans might look like. Um, that's important because they were going first. They were trying to put um, the meat on the bones in terms of what FMPs would look like. And I think for us, it's important to reflect on the fact that these are really new tools. So the Fisheries Act gives us an architecture. So it, it talks about the things that um, should be included within an FMP. But I think inevitably, as administrations, we've then looked to develop the FMPs. Um, it's become quite clear that you know, it, it's fine to talk about sustainability of fish stocks in the context of um, whether or not we're fishing at maximum sustainable yield levels. But actually, when you look at the entirety of how we're fishing and think about the other objectives within the Fisheries Act, so things like the bycatch objective, things like um, the precautionary approach, etc., then actually the content of the FMPs becomes much bigger. So. I think when we when we started out, probably quite naively, we thought that it would be quite straightforward in terms of drafting the, the Scottish lead plans. Um, these are all quota management stocks that we're looking at, so they're all, they've all got a really well-established approach in terms of management and how we engage with other coastal states in terms of how we set quotas, for example. Um, but actually, learning from DEFRA in relation to the front runner plans and then thinking about our own development, that thinking time took much longer than we thought it would. So that's the first kind of chunk in terms of why why it just the, the delays have kind of happened. Um, but we've also been keen to learn from the approach as well. So as as administrations, we've been really engaging closely together to think about well, um, you know, how can we learn from the front runner plans? How can we then adapt our approach? Um, late last year, we started to engage with stakeholders. So we pulled together not just Scottish stakeholders, but stakeholders from across the UK. Um, to have some initial discussions on what the drafting might look like from a Scottish-led perspective, um, how we might take into account all of these wider objectives, for example, within the Fisheries Act, 
Um, and those discussions were really useful and they helped to shape some initial drafts. But it also made it quite clear to us that actually the, the meat that was going to need to go into, into these FMPs was probably much more detailed than we perhaps initially thought. Um, and also the things that go along to support the FMPs are also really robust and there's quite a lot of them. So things like strategic environmental assessment and um, things like lots of impact assessments that would need to produce. Um, it, it feels obvious now, but actually at the time we were still very much feeling our way in terms of what was what was needed. So it's been a learning process for us. Um, things have inevitably, as the Cabinet Secretary's pointed out, in terms of that engagement, not only with stakeholders, but also across the administrations, it's taken time. And it became clear to us through the course of this year and, th and through the course of discussions with ad other administrations that actually additional time was needed to make sure that we were engaging with stakeholders properly, that we got the process right, that we weren't trying to rush this through, that we gave appropriate space and time for consultation to take into account the consultation and also to produce supporting, supporting documents as well. So um, whilst there's a, there's a lengthy delay that we're proposing, we intend to use that time well to get these FMPs right and to make sure that we're properly engaged and that we've, we've produced all the documents that we need to produce for them. Thank you. Was, was there any consideration to, to bring forward and publish some of the plans when they were ready, if you like? So whilst there would be some interaction between all the plans at some level, whether that's between the nations or actually just between fisheries, was there any consideration to actually bring forward plans for certain fisheries early to address some of, some of the issues that have been raised? Um, so some of the stakeholders have suggested that um, you know, it will have a, a, a significant negative impact on the delivery of sustainable fisheries um, with regards to the likes of the scampi industry, nephrops, um, a, you know, landing obligations or whatever. So was there any consideration to bring forward some plans of a as a matter of urgency to, to address some of these concerns raised by, in particular, the, the NGOs? I think, um, first of all, in relation to some of the points that you've raised there, and I think uh, perhaps Jane can again talk a bit more about the, the process of the plan. So the GF has... The GFS has ultimately set out the criteria by which we were, uh, how we determined what plans we were going to bring forward and within what timescale. I think that's where I, I wouldn't agree with some of the evidence in relation to the fact that there is no action on, on fisheries in the absence of an FMP. I mean, I, I, I would just absolutely refute that because we have a suite of management measures in place. We also have a whole range of pieces of work ongoing in relation to how we manage our fisheries, whether that's in the, the inshore, there's the ongoing work that's, um, that's happening, of course, in relation to the fisheries management measures for MPAs and for, for PMFs. So I think that that's where I wouldn't agree with those assertions that were made uh, in, relation, uh, in relation to that, because it doesn't prevent us from taking any work, uh, undertaking any of the work that we're doing already. And as I said in my opening comments, the FMPs are really about well showing uh, well we have specific obligations and some things that we have to set out within uh, FMPs but it's about making it will make all that work that we're doing a lot more transparent set it out in a more transparent way but pulls a lot of that that work together and it's an additional tool rather than something that is completely absent at the moment so I think I would just want to be be clear on that. Okay thank you I've got Rhoda Grant and then Ariane Burgess. Thank you, Convener. Um, can we get a timeline on when this work is going to be done? My understanding is that the other nations have at least produced drafts, so are the industry and stakeholders are aware of maybe what they are looking to do, and that consultation will be taking place. But, I mean, when can our stakeholders expect drafts, and what is the timeline for each stage? When does this all become more apparent, what is in the government's thinking? Uh, well, again, I'll, I think Jane will be able to talk through, I think, some of the estimated times that we have for each of the different stages, because as I set out previously, there will be that engagement with stakeholders. There are the assessments that need to take place. There's then the discussions that we need to have with the other administrations. There's a consultation. There's then a redraft before we publish the final uh, FMPs as well. So we believe that the, two, the additional two-year timescale we've set out allows us enough time to work through those, those processes. But again, Jane can talk through, I think, some of the, the time and how that time scale and that timetable is looking as a result of that. 
Now, you mentioned some of the FMPs that have been published by um, other administrations as well, and Jane set out that some of those were the, the front-runner uh, FMPs. But ag again, I think it's really important to point out that we have to work through our own processes here. And again, while some FMPs have been published, it's not a case... It, uh, yes, some of those have been published, but all administrations are finding themselves in the same position when it comes to this and needing additional times for the remaining FMPs that are in uh, that are in Annex A. In relation to the drafts being shared with stakeholders, I mean, as you'll see from the, the evidence that the committee received, I mean, there's been some criticism of the, the early drafts that have been shared with stakeholders. And as Jane had outlined, there were initial discussions with stakeholders to really look at what FMPs might look like and the information that that would contain. So, we fully intend to have that discussion with stakeholders. Again, it was only very initial drafts that were shared with them. There will, of course, be future drafts, and we will continue those discussions. But that's where this additional time is needed to enable that to happen in a meaningful way. Um, thank you. And just to build on that in terms of the timeline, so I, I agree, we agree, that it's really important to make sure that we've got that, that clear timeline in place. I think we're very conscious of the need to give stakeholders in particular that clarity so that they understand when there might be a call on their time. So, um, you know, we're, we're consultation heavy. There's a, there's a big call on stakeholders' time at the moment. Um, and it, it can be challenging, um, not only for us, but actually for stakeholders to be able to properly engage with the process and to be able to have the time and space to be able to consider fully what, what it is that we're looking at. Um, so we're very, we're very conscious that that clarity that the, the, the perhaps not had that going forward that it will be important to be able to set that out and make sure that they understand when we'll be asking for their input. So the first, the first call on the on stakeholder time really will be um, in the new year. We'll be asking them to come together to help us to look at the to look at drafting um, and to get their input and to make sure that they've, we're taking their views into account. So there'll be a what we what we're calling a pre-consultation stage. So we've done some initial pre-consultation. Um, we'll then do some further pre-consultation ahead of any formal public consultation later next year. Um, but we'll, we'll seek to set those timescales out for them so that they understand that they, they will need to respond to you know, quite a lot of FMPs, actually. Um, they'll need to read documents. They'll need to then um, think about them and consider them in the context of, of their own um, different views. So once we've got a timeline, um, which on the back of these discussions, um, we'll hopefully be able to do quite quickly. We'll be able to share that with stakeholders. We're happy to share that with the committee, if that would be helpful, um, to give that clarity about what the next two years looks like. Um, and just in relation to that point about phasing, because I think that that's important as well, and, and thinking about how we might split the, the FMPs to make them manageable. Um, there's, there's three groups of FMPs. So we've got 21 plans, but um, there's two NEFROPS plans, which are quite distinct. Um, there's a group of demersal plans and a group of pelagic plans. Um, and whilst it makes, it makes sense to group those together, so I think that when we're thinking about demersal plans, thinking about you know, whitefish, haddock, cod, saith, they're all swimming together, they're all part of a mixed fishery, and actually the way in which we manage those fisheries is quite similar. So for us, it makes sense to have them as a group and to think about them in that context. Same with nephrops, same with pelagic. So we might see some phasing coming through um, to make it more manageable, both for us and for stakeholders. Um, but again, that can be confirmed once we've got that timeline in place. Thank you. Uh, Ariane Burgess. Uh, thanks, Convener. And, and that was really helpful, actually, um, talk, that you <coughs> outlined the 21 plans. Uh, um, I just wanted to come back to the Cabinet Secretary. You described, um, you, you stated that there's a, an existing suite of measures, and I'd be interested to hear a description of what those are in your mind, just so we understand what exists already that you're, you're aware of. Um, and, th and then the other thing is I'm wondering is, do you see this as a, we've got these existing measures on how we're managing fisheries, and is, is the plan, when the plans come in, is there a kind of transition into those plans, or will some of the measures that you're going to unpack for us stay in place as well? Uh, 
Uh, absolutely. And I, I think they're very much a, a compli complementary measure to what we're doing. And as I say, I think they'll be really helpful in setting it in a more transparent way how we manage our, our fisheries and will make that a, a lot clearer for people. I mean, I, measure, I, I mentioned that we have a number of strands of work underway already, and again, which will all add to the sustainable management of our fisheries. And I think when you look at some of the work that the committee's dealt with already, you know, I appeared in front of the committee to discuss our proposals for REM. We also had the consultation looking at wider rollout of VMS as well. Uh, we have been, I, I mean, I know that in some of the stakeholder evidence too, and there were concerns raised about bycatch, how we were looking to tackle those issues. Again, we consulted a, a couple of years ago now on the future catching policy and have been developing work on that to really tackle some of the challenges that we know exist there too. So again, the FMP process doesn't stop any of this work happening. It will happen anyway because we know that we can always improve and that's what we're always looking to strive to do. And I think when you look particularly in the case of REM, where we're the first nation in the, the EU that's really leading on that work. So it is, I, I think, really uh, quite exciting in that regard. Um, but of course, like anything, we know there's more work to do, but that's why we're continuing these strands of work. I also mentioned the work that's being done to deliver the fisheries management measures for the MPAs and the priority marine features as well and that's been ongoing again another big and complex piece of work given the number of sites that are involved um, but all of that will continue the, and that will I think very much complement what's happening with the FMP process and uh, I think throughout the fisheries management plans it will draw some of that that together but I don't know if there's anything further you want to add to that Jane. Um, just really briefly I think um, we have our fisheries are some of the most regulated in the world um, we have lots of legislation in place, for example, um, the legislation under the retained EU law, so common fisheries policy, technical conservation measures, lots in terms of control regulations. Um, all of that carried through when the UK left the EU, so we have, we have that baseline level of, um, of legislation in place. In addition, we then also have in the UK, we have the UK Fisheries Act, which has um, lots of obligations in terms of the different objectives and, and how, we're, how we should achieve that sustainability in terms of fisheries management and also marine management. Um, and we have the Joint Fisheries Statement that outlines how the policy authorities seek to do that. So in addition to the, the measures that the Cabinet Secretary has outlined, where we're looking to deliver some of those improvements, we also have a, a really vast swathe of legislation in place mm -hmm. that protects our fish stocks and which seeks to protect the marine environment as well. So do we need to improve in some areas? Yes, absolutely. And that's, that's what we've, we've set out. Um, but I think that it's important to remember that there is already a lot mm -hmm. that, that restricts what fishers can do um, and which supports them to act responsibly and sustainably, which, of course, the vast majority of fishermen would like to do anyway. Okay. Can, uh, uh, Apologies. Can I, I've got. Can I, can, I've got a supplementary. Section. Okay. Thanks. Um, yeah. So that's. Um, that's interesting to hear that UK fisheries are most regulated. Some of the most regulated <coughs> in the world. But I'd be interested to hear because I think one thing is to have regulation, but then the other is actually enforcing and monitoring. Um, so, so that's one part. I just want to kind of name that. But I, I want to um, just come back to. We have 21 plans that you're working on in Scotland out of it. What is it, 29 plans in total, something like that? Um, I wonder, um, and Scotland has a very large part of the kind of UK waters that we're responsible for. Um, is, is there something in, in the mix there around budget allocation for the work that needs to be done in Scotland, given that there's more um, fisheries management plans that need to be developed? Uh, is the right amount of resource being allocated or is that part of the issue of the delay that there's not enough people actually in Marine Director able to put their attention to this work? I mean, as I've outlined in a previous response, I think, you know, there's been a, a whole range of different issues that I think have, have led to the delay and it's not necessarily just a resource problem. I mean, it is just as uh, both myself and Jane have outlined already this morning uh, that this is a completely new process. I think all the steps that we've uh, had to go through that we still need to go through as well. Again, this is, they are joint plans, even though the Scottish Government is leading on them, so we still have to have those discussions with other administrations as well. By its very nature, that has just taken a, 
I think, more time, and that will continue to take more time, which is why we're looking for the extension that we are. And I think we've had this discussion previously in the committee, I think, in the past few appearances when I've come around budget and resources. Uh, and I think, you know, there's probably no part of government that would say it couldn't do with more budget and couldn't do with more resource. You know, as with uh, all other areas, you know, we are working within the best resources that, that we have available at the moment. And that's where, again, we've had to ask for this timeline, which other uh, administrations have, have had to do too, um, to allow us to complete that process. But we believe it can be achieved with that additional time and if all of that is agreed. OK. And, and what could you... Uh, can you explain what's in place to ensure that the committee, if it's us, in two years' time, um, are not back here hearing uh, for a request for more time? Again, well, as Jane had outlined in a previous response, once we have a firmer idea of the timetable, I know that that would be not just helpful for our stakeholders, but we'd be happy to share that with the committee because I know it will probably help with your own workload, which I, I, I know will be a lot over the coming years. But like you say, it could well be into a new administration then. But I think uh, as much clarity as we can provide on that, we, we absolutely will. OK, thank you. Um, my apologies, Rhoda. I, I did. I cut you off while you were mid-questioning, um, so I'm going to come back to, to Rhoda Grant. Yeah, just a very quick question on the back of actually that last question as well. And um, when can we expect? You know, we can't see a timeline now. When can we at least expect to see uh, a draft timeline of when all of this is going to happen? Um, I think if we if we commit to making sure a timeline's in place by the end of the year. And we could do that. Um, we'll also, one of the reasons why I'm hesitating is <clears throat> just because that timeline, because, it, because the joint plans, I need to make sure that across the administrations, um, it's not just me that needs to sign up to those timescales, it's also the other administrations as well. Um, because, and it actually speaks to the point that was just made in terms of resourcing, we're drawing on resources from across the administrations, lots of expertise um, from different um, policy teams, from people who are experts, science scientists, and um, people who are out negotiating in terms of um, quotas and coastal states. So actually it's not dependent on one singular person, it's dependent on a whole team of people being able to input as mm -hmm. well. So it's just, I need to make sure that um, I'm not just speaking for us, I'm speaking for the other administrations as well. But I think either way, I would just want to say we want to be as open and transparent with the committee as possible. So I think if there are any issues in doing that, we'll also write to the committee with an update. Absolutely. That was going to be my next question, so I appreciate that. Uh, Emma Harper. <coughs> Excuse me. Thanks, convener. Good morning to you both. Um, I'm not a fish expert, and I just looked at the UK government website. There's 43 fisher, fisheries management plans, and there's five current consultations about cockles, about North Sea Channel Sprat, Queen Scallops, Southern North Sea Skates and Rays, and other demersal non-quota species. So it's, there's a lot of separate species in each fisheries management plan. But can you clarify for me, Jane, I think that the fisheries management plans, you said they're grouped together, so that demersal pelagic and um, is, is that to help, I, I suppose, manage the plans together because similar species are in the same waters? And then there's the whole issues of, uh, uh, I suppose, managing the plants so that it, uh, it, it, so that they're not just individual species that are looked at. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah so the the grouping that I talked about is almost a virtual grouping. Um, we have the list of 21, and um, they are single stock plans. So you'll have a um, a cod plan, a haddock plan, a saith plan. Um, but I think it's really useful to think of them as a package of work. So um, each fish is different and each the characteristics of different stocks are very different and the state of the stock can be different and how we manage it can be different. But the similarities between lots of different fish, so um, in particular um, for demersal species, for whitefish species, um, whilst they're different, they, the way that we fish them is very similar. Um, they're often caught together, so it's part of a mixed fishery. And sometimes they are, the health of one depends on the health of another. 
Um, and actually, the ma a management measure that we do for one actually can be replicated across the piece. So whilst the single species plans, I think um, how, we're, how we're looking at them is in terms of batches. So we're thinking of them in terms of um, this is a demersal grouping, this is a pelagic grouping, etc. Um, so it, it's not a for, it's not a formal group, and it doesn't it won't appear in any of the documentation that says ah oh, these are the demersal plants. But how we will consult on them, how we'll develop them, um, how we'll do things like our strategic environmental assessment, we'll very much group them together um, and consider them as part of that, because we recognise that there are interactions between these stocks, and it's it's for us. I think that we have to make those connections. We have to think about and talk about. Um, how the different plans interact, how the fisheries interact between them. Um, there's, a, there's a classic example um, for um, when we talk about rockhall cod and rockhall haddock, for example, and how we manage those two stocks. You've got a very healthy stock, which is your rockhall haddock, and then you've got rockhall cod, which has had some issues in the past. And they're caught together, so we actually need to think about the interaction, and we always do when we're, when we're thinking about management, but we, we need to think about the interaction between those stocks, because actually, although they're single species plans, it does make sense to think of them on a kind of multi-species basis. So, sorry, that's a, that's a real, um, a, it's, a circ, it's a circular kind of discussion that you sort of go around in this, but I think it's, it's important to do both. It's important to think about them on a single stock base, basis, but also to think about them in terms of that multi-stock basis and how they all interact together. And that's the job for us, which speaks to some of the complexities yeah. that we have in terms of the drafting. OK, thanks. That's helpful. I, I know, I know uh, Tim Eagle's got a question on COD uh, plans, so it may be of appropriate time, given that your, your previous comments bring Tim in at the moment. Tim Eagle. Uh, yeah, I think, uh, well, apologies, convener, and to the Cabinet Secretary for being late this morning. Some, my train was running slightly late. Um, it was just on, uh, some concerns have been raised, haven't they, about recovery of the cod species and the fact that the plans are being merged together. And it was just on that general point of, of like, how are you going to sort of rectify some of the concerns that were raised in the consultation? Yeah, I, I'm hoping Jane's response has been able to illustrate that, you know, how we how we consider that, uh, even though we're looking at individual stocks. And I, under, I appreciate, though, from the the committee's call for evidence that there was some concern about the merging of the, the two COD plans in particular. Um, but that's really been to, to match, I think, the science and management approach um, from ICES, which considers them as, uh, as the same stock. And I, I realise that this harks back to some discussion that we'd had um, about Clyde COD earlier in the year and that there's been some work ongoing um, to consider that. But I would just say that even though we're taking that approach, it doesn't mean that we're not able to look at uh, the different characteristics in, in the species as well. And of course, if more evidence becomes available, we, we would be considering that anyway. But I don't know if there's anything further you'd want to add to that, Jane. Um, I think that, Does that just covers it. Yeah. OK, can I come back? Just, so, yeah, just, just to be specific then, so where you might identify that there are specific population trends or whatever it might be within an individual part of that, you will be able to come... Yeah, be able to help support that should the science evolve, I suppose, over time. Yeah, yeah. That, I, think, I think that would just give reassurance to those that have raised concerns around that point. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Uh, Beatrice Wishart. Uh, thanks, convener. Actually, Tim Eagle has uh, asked the questions I was, I was going to, I was going to ask. Um, um, but I would just say that when we're talking about sustainable fish stocks, we should have at the forefront of our minds those who are at the front line of our fishing industry and the importance of having accurate scientific data for sustainable livelihoods as well as for species protection. Um, and, and with regard to the proposed technical changes, and, and I mean, Tim Eagle has put uh, uh, the, the questions regarding the, the variation in the cod stocks between the sort of North Sea cod and the West of Scotland's cod. Um, just in terms of Professor Michael Heath's uh, uh, con concerns that he raised about the um, subspecies, um, I, I wonder if you could add a bit more to what was, was said in reply to Tim Eagle. 
Uh, yes, that's fine. I think, first of all, I just want to, to touch on your first point there, and I think you're, you're absolutely right about the, uh, about the sustainable livelihoods. And that, I think that's where that really comes through the Fisheries Act as well. It's about how we balance all the objectives are there. And, of course, our environment is critically uh, important. Supporting a healthy marine environment is good for the livelihoods of our, of our fishermen as well. But we've also we've got to balance that against the, the economic uh, the situation as well. And I do think that... Of course, our, our fishermen do their very best to, to fish sustainably, and again, it's within all our, our interests to see that to see that happen. Now, in relation to specifically, I think the, the merging and the concerns about the two plans that you've outlined there. Now, it's been since last year that ICESM considered the North Sea and West of Scotland cod to be part of the same biological stock. So that's why we decided to merge those plans. It was really just to reflect the, the latest scientific understanding of the stock, and that's in line with the ICES advice structures as well. So I hope that helps explain, uh, explain the approach that we've taken there. Um, but, of course, if there's any area-specific management measures that need to be taken uh, in the, between the North Sea and West of Scotland, we would, of course, be considering that through the, the process of the, of the FMP2. So I hope that provides some reassurance on that front. Thank you. That's fine. Uh, Rhoda Grant. Just, just a short supplementary on that. Um, will the stocks um, North Sea and West Coast be monitored separately so it will become very obvious if there are divergence and the plan needs to be changed? Um, so on that, I think it's worth reflecting for, for cod, and I know it's such an iconic species and we, we, we spend a, a lot of time talking about cod, um, quite rightly so, it's important to our fishing industry and it's important to us. Um, there was a lot of work that was done um, over the course of the last few years to, to put the cod through a, a benchmark exercise in terms of ICs. So that's important because for a long time, um, our, our view from um, Scotland and the UK was that the, there was there was one cod stock, so although we were treating it separately in terms of North Sea and West of Scotland, actually there was a lot of evidence about the stock straddling um, the two sea areas. And for us, it makes sense, if you're talking about one stock, to make sure that the management follows the biology of the stock and that the, we're considering the health in the round of the stock so that you've actually got um, the appropriate assessment in place to be able to manage it effectively. So that's a long-winded way of saying um, through the benchmark exercise, um, we were really pleased with the outcome because it did reflect what, what fishermen were seeing on the ground. Um, it reflected the abundance of cod that we were seeing um, in the west of Scotland and the North Sea, um, and it enabled us to put in place um, an assessment that would look at the whole of the northern shelf cod, as it's now called, um, rather than considering it as a separate North Sea and a separate West of Scotland. Now, within that, there are complexities, because in the North Sea, we already see that there are three distinct um, stocks, um, and we also see that the health of the stock fluctuates. So, for example, in the northern part of the North Sea, the stock is pretty healthy. Um, in the southern component of the North Sea, the stock is not particularly healthy. Um, so within our management already, we take account of these differences. And um, when we're agreeing quota levels, when we're total allowable catch levels um, with other coastal states, we, we look at the advice that's produced by ICs and we consider how we want to appropriately manage them. The stock taken into account the scientific advice, but also taken into account the socio-economics as well. So it's a really complex way of looking at it. Um, but effectively, it means that the processes that we have in place are already set up to enable us to take into account some of these differences. Um, you're always going to get some some interesting kind of differences within there as well. So we've talked a little bit about Clyde Cod. Um, but effectively, I think the, the management is, is set up to enable us to manage properly. The FMPs should hopefully reflect that too. And the process that we go through every year on an annual basis and on an ongoing basis is our scientists look at the data, ICs look at the data, um, our policy experts look at the data, and we're considering the round. And obviously, if, there are, if there's things in there that suggest that our management approach needs to adjust or adapt or change, then we are flexible enough to be able to do that. And the trick with the FMPs is to enable that they are flexible enough to be able to deal with that as well. 
That, that was quite a long answer, but I think you're basically telling me, yes, those stocks are monitored separately. Yes. And changes <laughs> in different ones could be identified quite quickly. Yeah, absolutely. OK, thank you. Thank you. Um, Ariane Burgess. Thanks, Convener. Um, I just wanted to unpack the, the fisheries management plans that we're talking about, and I'd be interested to hear um, a description of what kinds of measures will actually sit within these plans that are different from the ones that were listed, just so we can understand, once those plans are in place, what, what, are, we, what are we actually managing? Yeah, again, Jane, Jane, I don't know if you want to go, go into more detail yeah. on that, having dealt with the, and that, the process so far. So the content is still being finalised. Um, and I think the structure and the architecture is really important to make sure that we're covering what we need to cover. Um, a lot of the FMP will be about that transparency in terms of some of our current management. These are all jointly managed stocks that we're talking about. And by jointly managed, I mean that we manage them with other coastal states. So our management of these stocks is never entirely within our gift. Um, but I think for stakeholders and the general public, it's important for us and the FMPs to make sure that we're setting out how that joint management works. So thinking about, and you will, you will of course see the documents, um, thinking about how the FMP looks. We talk a lot about joint management and how it's done in an international forum. We talk a lot about the actual stock and the different, and the biological differences of the stock, the fishery that's involved in actually um, fishing the stock. Um, so there's quite a lot of detail in terms of the current management approach. Within that, there might be aspects of it that we want to improve. So um, coastal states management works, you know, it works well, but there are also areas where we might want to improve it. So having in place long-term management strategies that are jointly developed with other coastal states is something that we aspire to. Um, and you'll see that reflected in some of the plans that, that need that. Um, and to make sure that actually we've jointly managed them properly on an international scale. Um, the rest of the FMP will talk about, you know, the pressures, for example, in the wider environment. So it might talk about um, if it's a bottom trawling measure that's involved in, in fishing the stock, it might talk about the benthic impacts and what we're going to do about that. Um, if there's a particular issue with discards or bycatch, then it might talk about that. Um, it will set out where we think that we have measures in place or in development that actually are sufficient and it will also identify areas where we think it's insufficient and it will put in place new actions to deal with that. So it depends on the stock, um, but it will hopefully cover the entirety of the management of that stock and the fishery that's within it. Uh, and will it include, so obviously this um, joint fisheries statement and then plans have come out of the Fisheries Act and the kind of first page of the Fisheries Act is the eight objectives, which include ecosystems and um, uh, good environmental stages of the seabed. Will the fisheries management plans include indicators that are going to monitor the progress and, and give you give the joint states an understanding of when something needs to, to, to change? Yes. Okay. And um, uh, one of the things that strikes me when we're working in the Marine Space and Committee is that... Um, um, I get a sense that sometimes you know, if you're a fisherman out at sea, you're not necessarily cognizant to plans that are being imposed on how you have to change your practices. What are you going to put in place to make sure that fishers are aware of the fisheries management plans and changes they might have to, to do to their practices? I mean, that's the thing. I think through the... There will be a lot of, I think, detailed stakeholder engagement throughout all of this uh, throughout this process as well. So I would like to think that anything that's being developed isn't going to suddenly hit our, our fishermen by surprise, um, because the, I, I think that's why uh, having this extension to the timeline is so critically important to make sure that we're having that consultation, we are having that engagement. But again, I see the, just harking back to my opening comments to the committee as well, I see the, the fisheries management plans as being very much complementary uh, to our approach, setting it in a more transparent way, what we're doing, as well as some of the, the other issues that Jane talked about, they will cover it as well. Um, so I, I hope all of that will be helpful and, and informative as we go through this process, not to mention, of course, the formal periods of consultation that we'll have to. We, we just <clears throat> worked together um, on the uh, agricultural rural communities 
which is now an act, hooray. Uh, and in that, we had a piece there around continual professional development CPDs. And I wonder what your thoughts are around bringing in CPDs for this kind of thing, so that fishermen, to get a license, they need to actually do that development work, professional development work, in order to, you know, have them really move alongside what is going to be big changes potentially in their sector. I mean, again, we've already got a suite of work underway, and I think the approach that we take to, to our fisheries management in general is really trying to, like, when you look at the, the work that we've been doing with our, our FMAC, it's about trying to get that, that bottom-up approach to, to managing our fisheries and making sure that we're working with our fishers and with our wider stakeholders as we implement that as well. I think in relation to the specific measure you're talking about, obviously there are specific things that we have to cover within a, a fisheries management plan. And I, I mean, that's not an area that I'm aware of as being considered at the moment anyway. It's certainly not being, being put to me. OK, thanks. Uh, Elena Whittle. Thank you, convener. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, the committee has become very aware um, of wild wrasse when we're looking at our follow-up salmon inquiry. And I would like to spend a wee bit of time um, talking about that as a non-quota species. Um, so the Cabinet Secretary will also be aware, as we are now, um, of petition PE 2110, which is um, calling on the, the Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to look at introducing um, a statutory fisheries management plan focusing on protecting um, wild wrasse stocks, given their particular vulnerabilities that they have in terms of um, their biological and reproductive characteristics. So I'd like to, to spend a bit of time just to explore in that, if, if that's OK. Um, when we think about um, RAS and um, the use of you know, them within that industry, I know that there was a, a, a call for views back in 2020 that resulted in some um, measures to control the harvesting of live RAS from the, the salmon fam, um, farming industry. Can you please describe to us how that's actually working in practice at the moment, those control measures? Uh, yes, we have to. But first of all, I mean, I know that you've touched on the petition there. I, I'm not too sure if the committee will have been copied into the correspondence that I've sent to the, the petitions committee. So just to be aware of the, the update and the work on that. So you're absolutely right. In 2021, we introduced uh, mandatory measures in relation to that. But as I've updated the petitions committee, I think just in recent weeks, actually, we've been in receipt of a piece of work that's been done by Glasgow University which is providing us with new evidence on RAS interactions with our special areas of cons uh, conservation and in marine protected areas as well. So on the back of that then, that will, we've asked Nature Scott to do further work for us so that we can get that advice before we enter into a, a new season uh, over, over the course of next year. So I think it's really important that we were able to do that work and get that underway. But I think just more widely, I think in relation to the issue of F FMPs, I mean, Obviously, in the GFS, we set out the criteria as to how we selected the species that we're bringing forward FMPs for in the first place. RAS isn't included in that at the moment, but of course, we, we think it's right that we focus on the FMPs that we've said we're going to do and that we've already published. But of course, that doesn't prevent us from bringing forward a fisheries management plan if we think that's going to be needed uh, for RAS. But what I would say is, even in the absence of a fisheries management plan, we're continuing with this work anyway to ensure that it is a, a sustainable fishery going forward. So thinking about those measures where you're looking at the Habitats Act and you're going to be um, undertaking that bit yeah. of, of research and, and to figuring out what you do before the, the next um, season opens in May, is there a possibility that that will link into a future development of a fisheries management plan? And would you be seeking to look at um, the, the plan that's um, in draft form just now um, in England to actually perhaps align the two the two plans together? Because we do understand um, that DEFRA are... Um, looking at our, our RAS's complex fisheries, fisheries management plan. Uh, uh, absolutely, but that's what we're saying. I mean, if there's any learning that we can take from FMPs that are already being done, then we would absolutely look to do that. And, of course, uh, DEFRA have been leading on some of the fisheries management plans for some of the non-quota species, which we haven't got at the moment. And, of course, we want to. We knew that, that those areas were always going to be more complex. So I think it's really important we learn from the processes that they've been through in relation to that as well. But, again, there's nothing preventing us from doing that in the future, but I think the focus for us right now is to deliver the 21 FMPs that we've set out in Annex A of the GFS. Um, but of course, should anything change in relation to that, then we could always bring one forward. Yep. So just one final question, just for, for clarity. Um, it, the, the species themselves at the moment, in the absence of a, a fisheries management plan, are still afforded some protection under the measures that are already in place at the moment 
and which you may seek to bring in? Uh, well, that's time. the thing. I mean, we don't have a fisheries management plan in place for RAS at the moment, but that hasn't prevented us from taking, a, from taking measures in the past. It wouldn't prevent us from taking measures now. So you've already highlighted the mandatory measures that we introduced in 2021. We didn't need an FMP to do that. And again, it's the same here. If we identify there's an issue with the stock, we can take action. We don't need to wait on a, a development or a potential FMP to address any issues. Thank you. Uh, thank you for, for that response. Does that go for, for other fisheries? So, um, the, the, the lack uh, of a FMP wouldn't stop uh, development of a cockle or a periwinkle or a whelk fishery, uh, or you know, investment in that. That's what, what would trigger. Uh, the Marine Directorate looking at some of these other fisheries. So we've heard about that there, there, there's a trigger that may result in an, uh, a, a plan for RAS. What would trigger an FMP for cockles or periwinkles or whelks or other inshore fisheries? I mean, again, we've set out the criteria that was used to identify the species that we're bringing forward just now. And I think, you know, quite rightly, that's the focus. Those are the plans we've published and that we said that we would bring forward. Now, again, that's not to say that there wouldn't, there's not, that's the absolute definitive final list of FMPs uh, by no means. But I think, you know, we've set that out, a timescale for that, which we hope to be extended. Uh, but again, in terms of action, and I hope as I've just outlined in relation to RAS, if there are measures that need to be taken with any stock, we don't need an FMP in place to do that. Mm -hmm. But if it turns out that it would be beneficial to produce an FMP, and again, we know that there are other species being looked at by other authorities, we want to have a, a look at that. And again, if there's learning we can take for our own approach in Scotland, then we would do that. But again, I, I would just want to emphasise... and. I think Jane said in a previous response to, I think all the, the legislation, the regulation that we have in place at the moment, you know, if we need to take, uh, uh, to take action or there's more work to be done, we can do that, um, as I hope you've seen with not just RAS, but some of the other species that we've talked about at committee previously. Okay. I suppose it's just in, in, in practice, do, 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 do fishermen or NGOs write to Jane and say, we've got an issue with whelks, you, you need to look at this? Is there a... a a weight of evidence or whatever that, that triggers that? Well, I would say that, uh, and Jane, you'll probably want to come in, you'll be dealing more with the day-to-day day -day of this than, than me, but I think it's important to highlight that you, I think an example of that is when we look at the interim measures that were introduced for the, for the inshore fisheries this year, and that's on the back of evidence we receive. We can't forget our, the forums that we have to discuss with our stakeholders as well, and you know where we will hear about those issues there too, whether that's from our regional inshore fisheries group. We have an inshore subgroup of the, the FMAC as well, uh, where all of that would be discussed, and that's where some of these measures um, come from. But I don't know if there's anything further you want to add to that, Jane. I think that's right. I think um, we have a lot of close engagement with industry and others um, through the various different forums. It an approach from um, a fisherman can take a number of different forms. Um, it might be that they're chatting to one of our coastal officers. Um, it might be that they're engaging through the regional and inshore fisheries groups. It might be that they write directly to the cabinet secretary mm -hmm. or to one of the officials. So um, they tend to they tend to come from a number of different ways. Um, at this point, I don't think there's from a fisherman's perspective, I don't think they would necessarily connect the a fisheries management plan might be something that they might want. Um, I think if there are concerns about a particular fishery and access to that fishery, then they would probably use one of the established routes that they've got. Um, but clearly, you know, we, we listen to what's been, been said. Um, we also take into account the scientific evidence. We also think about um, the other list of priorities that we're currently working on, um, and it's considered within the round. Okay, thank you. Um, Ariane Burgess. Uh, thanks, convener. Um, Cabinet Secretary, you've mentioned the um, FMAC um, a number of times this morning, and I'd be interested to understand uh, what your role is in, in that. Um, we've been hearing from stakeholders um, that it's not necessarily a satisfactory forum and a bit frustrating, uh, and that things aren't necessarily being people's um, concerns are not necessarily being heard. And, and, and additionally, uh, we were in a discussion recently around the RAFGs and a bit of concern was raised there around, yes, there's some that are working really well, but others where it's un, kind of last updates of minutes of meetings with 2022. So 
you talk about these fora for engagement, but how well are they actually working? Well, that's the thing. It's something that we, we constantly look at. So in relation to the regional intro fisheries groups and both with FMAC as well, both had been through a bit of a refresh in recent years. Um, and again, I mean, we're in a process of reviewing the FMAC structures that's put on a more formal footing with the terms of reference uh, and a more established structure than it did have previously. But of course, like anything, when we make these changes, we've got to monitor them to see if they're working and do stakeholders think it's an effective forum? Are they getting what, what they would like to, to see? out of that too. So I think it's important that, that we are looking at that. So that works on going with FMAC and we're also doing that with our, the regional inshore fisheries groups as well. Okay, so um, could you come back to us with an update of, of when yes, you have looked to. at that? That would be great. Um, and then back to the fisheries management plans. I, I already asked about the kind of monitoring, effective monitoring of them um, and also the inclusion of um, the, the aim fisheries objectives. I'd be interested to understand a bit more uh, of, of how you're going to approach that to make sure that those objectives are really clear to uh, people who are going to be working in those particular fisheries. I, I think I'll touch on that first, and I don't know if Jane will have more to, to add to that, but I mean, it's set out in the GFS just how the fisheries management plans relate to the fisheries objectives, and it states within there that within the design and structure of FMPs, they do directly relate to sustainability, precautionary, scientific evidence, ecosystem and equal access fisheries objectives by delivering sustainable fisheries uh, and some of the other issues that are covered in there. And they can also address the wider objectives too, but I would fully expect that to be set out in the fisheries management plans, how, would it, how we're looking to achieve those objectives in the Act. Uh, just to add to that, I think, it, I think it's really important, the transparency point, mm -hmm. and actually um, even just some of the questions this morning have been about well, what's in place to actually manage our fisheries. And it is complicated. There's, mm -hmm. there's a lot. Um, and we have to look at a lot whenever we're introducing a fisheries management measure. You know, we have an act to look at. We have objectives to look at. We have a whole lots of other um, commitments that we need to look at as well. Um, so I think that it's really important for us to be crystal clear with stakeholders um, about how things relate together and how the things connect. So we've been doing a lot of work with the other authori um, authorities in the UK to think about how do we set out this information clearly. So um, in de de with DEFRA in some of their plans, um, what, they've, what they've done is directly linked the objectives to the actual actions to make sure that it's really clear about what it's looking to deliver. And we'll look to do something similar because I think it is really important to make sure that there's that transparency and that accountability so that people can see what it is that we're delivering and how it connects. Well, that sounds reassuring. I mean, certainly, I think over the last few years we've had been doing work where it's become really clear that fishers are not aware of the Fisheries 2020 Act, the Marine Scotland Act, and all of the things, the regulations within which we sit. And also, um, I get a sense that people are not, stakeholders are not really uh, clear that Scotland and the UK have signed up to a commitment to protect and restore. 30% of Scotland's land and seas by 2030. And I think that's something that really needs to filter down. And we see that with the national planning framework as well, where there's, we make these high level decisions, but it doesn't seem to um, get through on a more local level. And I think that's why I'm touching on the idea of CPD and uh, that kind of approach where we can really take people with us that in order to have a license or a quota or so on and so forth, you actually have to do some training and understand the shifting seascape that we are we're now working in but that's where I would come back to the, the point that Jane made that I think is really important in terms of all the different issues that you've touched on there is, and where I think FMPs will be a really useful tool is in terms of setting that out clearly and doing that in a really open and transparent way because, as Jane says, and no doubt, you know, I think we all glean from the discussions that we know from uh, various uh, appearances of audit committees before you know, managing our fisheries is complex and I think the more that we can do to, uh, to, sh to show that, to show in evidence how we're meeting our objectives uh, I think is, is for the better. And just a bit more on the plan. So in your kind of working out, the, it was great to hear, Jane, your descriptions of trying to figure your way out as to what these plans should be like. Stakeholders have raised concerns regarding the approach of a single, uh, looking at single species per plan, um, as opposed to a regional and area-based plan. I'm, and I wonder, as you're kind of thinking through these things, is there an opportunity to shift as you start to see maybe an area-based plan would be more appropriate? Yeah. Um, so I think my, my personal view is that FMPs will evolve 
So we have single species plans at the moment. We've talked already about the interconnections between them and the importance of making sure that they're seen as a, as a package and that we, we look at them as part of the wider ecosystem. Um, I think that the plans, there's, there's guidelines in terms of how often we need to review them and making sure that the, we're amending them to be aware of some of the changes that might be happening. Um, I think we're, we're open to adapting, we're open to considering if it's the best approach, if they need to adapt in the future. Um, I think at this point we're very much concentrating on delivering the plans that we've set out. But I also think that um, fisheries manage management always evolves. It always has to be part of a dialogue and a conversation. And I think if, you know, as we take our co-management kind of forward, we need to listen to each other and we need to listen to the evidence. So if there, if there is a need to evolve and adapt and change the plans in the future to better reflect um, the reality of management, then of course we'll be open to do that. It would certainly seem that an area-based regional approach might fit better with this ecosystems-based approach that mm -hmm. we're now being asked to look at through that Fisheries Act objective. It's something we can, we can consider. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Convener. Thank you. Um, just, just a, a final couple of questions. Uh, Cabinet said, could you give us the reasons for commissioning of sea fish to undertake uh, the, the work uh, in connection with the nephrop stocks in the North Sea and west of Scotland? Uh, yes, I'd be happy to. I mean, I know that this was an, an area of concern that was raised by stakeholders in the committee's call for evidence, but I think it's um, something that made sense to do because sea fish have a wealth of expertise in that area. I, I believe that they've also assisted uh, DEFRA in preparation of some of the fisheries management plans there as well. So for us, I think it, it, it makes sense to make best use of that expertise and that knowledge to assist us in that work. OK, I, I believe there was a... a, a in the region of £40,000 spent uh, commissioning sea fish. Is there a potential conflict of interest? Uh, because that, again, is something that has been raised by some stakeholders. I, again, I don't particularly believe that to be the case. Of course, like anything, when we commission somebody to do work, we would. Um, uh, I think it's only right that we would expect to, to pay them for that work. Again, they have a wealth of expertise in this, but it's not as if they'll be away developing a plan completely in isolation. Uh, again, we have a, a process which I hope we've been able to illustrate and outline today. Uh, the stakeholder engagement el of that, element of that, of course, is critical. Uh, working with our wider stakeholders, working with industry, uh, working with We'll have to have discussions with other administrations as well. There'll be a full public consultation. So all of that will be quite transparently set out. But I think that they've got that expertise, and that's what we're looking to utilise. OK. Would it potentially indicate a lack of capacity within the Marine Directorate? I mean, again, it's sea it, fish have also assisted with FMPs uh, down south as well, and they've got that expertise and that knowledge by the very nature of their work. So I think it makes sense for us to, to look to do that and to utilise that where possible, rather than potentially replicating or duplicating. OK. Um, I don't believe we've got any further questions. Um, so thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary, and, and can I thank Jane McPherson, which is always... Uh, answers the questions in, uh, particularly well. So thank you for your... Uh, <laughs> oh, both of you, of course. <laughs> both of you. Um, but th thank you for your, your contribution this morning. Uh, I'm now going to uh, briefly uh, pause the meeting to uh, allow a, a short comfort break.
So we now move on to consideration of a negative instrument, the Wildlife Management Consequential Amendment Scotland Regulation 2024, which is SSI 2024-268. Do any members wish to make comment on the instrument? Tim Eagle. Yeah, I didn't press that. Uh, thank you, convener. Uh, just a couple of wee comments uh, on it um, that, that have come up. One was in the letter that was sent back to the committee, there was a uh, part that said the uh, Scottish Government would help support those where the traps were going uh, with more information around courses, etc. Now, I don't believe that's been sent out, so I don't know if you've got any further information on that or we can get any more information on that. And the other one is, is around that sort of continuing point about the BRIA, the, the Business Recognition Impact Assessment. The thought being that, that there's this argument, isn't there, that, 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 that whilst there was one done originally, that didn't include the snares and the traps, therefore there probably does need to be another one. And I think just there are two things that actually still concern me about this moving forward. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think um, I certainly share concerns about the BRIA. Um, there, was, there was no BRIA for the, uh, to, to reflect the impact of a banning on snares, uh, given that the, the snaring ban... Uh, parts of legislation were brought forward as amendments at stage two, so the BRIA didn't cover it. Whereas uh, other uh, pieces of uh, legislation, for example, the Hunt with Dogs, did include a, a, a BRIA uh, because that was absolutely, you know, the intention of the uh, the bill, if you like. Um, so I just wonder whether we can uh, write to the minister confirming whether there's the, the, the possibility for. Uh, information relating to the impact assessment of a snaring ban on how uh, land managers and those protecting our, our, our endangered species can actually mitigate uh, the, the impact of a remover of snaring as part of their predator control. Any other comments? No. Uh, Tim, yes. Well, just one more, actually, um, that I flagged to myself. And that was around, uh, again, the Minister's letter on the, to the, on the 25th of October, around ground-resting nerd, ground nerd bird surveys. So I think one of the big things here, isn't there, is how do we monitor whether actually this, this ban is actually going to have an effect on that? So it's just to pick, potentially pick that up in a further letter as well, as to whether that or whether that, um, where the science, where the data is coming from on that, so that we can actually tell, because we, obviously that needs to be baselined and then moving forward what the impacts are. If that okay. makes sense. Thank you. Any other members? No. So I assume we're, we're all content. So that concludes our uh, proceedings in public. We'll now move into private session uh, and I suspend the meeting. Thank you.